Hello and welcome to Come and Dine. Uh, I know here in the last couple of weeks I've been doing a a Bible series on uh, learning on Bible characters in the Bible. Uh, for today I'm going to take a break away from that and I want to go with a, a scripture reading. And a scripture I want to read from is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. And uh, this is known, I'll not go get ahead of myself, but let, let me begin to read. And so this is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He said, Through us, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I have bestowed all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth, vaunteth not itself, and is not puffed up. Doth not behave, un, behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, and is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am. I am known. Now about it faith hope, and charities. These three things, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is usually known as the love chapter. And of course, where I am reading from the King James Version, and you know, charity is in, in King James language, is in general sense, love, benevolence, goodwill, that disposition, disposition of the heart which inclines men to think favorably, favorably of their fellow men, to think favorably, fa favorably of their fellow men and to do good to them. In a theological sense, it, is, it includes supreme love to God and the universal goodwill to men. Now we have to realize what is uh, the Greek word and meaning of love. We know in our society today, there is no way to tell the difference between loving somebody I mean, I could tell, I could tell my mom says I love her, and then in turn I said, you know, I love eating a Big Mac from McDonald's. You know, there is no distinction. But thankfully, there in the Greek language there is four uh, different words of love, and the first word is is called agape. And, you know, an agape is is out of one's heart by preciousness of the object of love. Is a love of esteem, <coughs> of evaluation. Forgive me, <coughs> forgive me. It has the idea of prizing. It is the noblest wo wo word for love that's in the Greek language. And it says agape is not kindled by merit or worth it, of its object, but it originates in its own God-given nature. You know, God and love. It delights in giving. So agape is the unselfish love. Uh, it gives and wants nothing in return. This love keeps on loving even when the loved one is unresponsive, unkind, unlovable, unworthy, and it is unconditional love. There is no condition. It is not a conditional thing. No, agape desires only the good of the loved one. It is a consuming passion, compassion for the well-being of others. Uh, there are some Verses, we know John 3.16. This is a great example of what agape love is. For God so loved the world that he, begot, he gave his only begotten Son 
Now, whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It can also be found in Romans 5, 5. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and in Ephesians 3, 17. And I like what Ephesians uh, 3, 17 describes this agape love, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, and by faith that ye be rooted and grounded in love. And then there's the second one, the second love in the Greek, and it's called phileo. And uh, by the way, uh, the word agape, forgive me for saying this, but there's a 116th occurrence of the word agape, of love, of charity, in the King James Bible. And for the word phileo, there's 25 appearances. Uh, phileo is a compatible love, companionable love, forgive me. This love speaks of affection, fondness, or liking. Uh, phileo is a love that responds to kindness, appreciation, or love. It involves giving as well as receiving. So there, there's a difference between agape and phileo. Agape gives without wanting nothing back. Phileo uh, gives love but expects something to come back. Uh, but when it is greatly strained, it can collapse in crisis. That's another difference between agape and phileo. Agape keeps on loving even though there is stress. Uh, phileo is a higher love than eros, and I will deal with that later, because it is our it is our happiness rather than my happiness. The phileo focuses on the happiness of two friends of a love they got together. This love is called out of one's heart by qualities in another. And the select references you know that you can refer to if you want to is Matthew chapter six, verse five. <coughs> Mark chapter 14, verses 44, Luke chapter 20, verse 46, and John chapter 5, verse 20. Uh, Titus 3.15 yeah, states this, All that with, are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And see, this is an example of uh, uh, phileo being used in uh, the King James Bible. Uh now, there is a place in the Bible that, that shows agape, <coughs> forgive me again, as opposed to uh, phileo. And this is found in uh, John chapter 21, uh, verses, one, what, verses 1 through 17. But I'm going to only hit a small section. Uh, this is where uh, the disciples went out fishing on the boat. And they were fishing all night. And Jesus showed up on the shore, shore and asked if they caught anything. And then he tells them to throw them down on the other side. And of course they catch a, uh, a, a lot of fishes. And they realize, some of them realized that you know, this was Jesus. And then, you know, then you know, Jesus you know, invites the disciples to come and dine. And then what he does is he turns his attention <coughs> to Simon Peter. And this is what he says starting off in John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had died, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And so what Jesus was saying, and he said, Simon, son of Peter, does thou agape me? <clears throat> and this is what Peter's response is. He saith unto him, Yea, your Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my seat. So what Simon Peter was saying, said, Yeah, Lord, I phileo you. And then Jesus said again, He said, He said unto him again, the second time, Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And I know again, Jesus was asking, uh, Agape me? And this is what Peter's response was. He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. So Peter was saying again, I phileo you. And you know, there, there's a lot of times with that can be hard to try to love to God in the agape type love. And you know, Jesus said unto Peter again, feed my sheep. And then this is, this is where uh, it gets really profound. Uh, Jesus asks Simon a third time. But you know, he didn't say agape. He said unto him the third time, son, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And so what Jesus said is, uh, Phileo me. 
And, you know, you know, we know that Peter was grieved because, you know, this was the third time that Jesus had asked him. And, you know, and Peter had denied the Lord three times. You know, and regardless of that, Jesus still loved Simon. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. You know, and then Jesus said, feed my sheep. So, you know, we got the first two inches. It's Jesus asking, Simon, I, I got to pay me. And uh, Simon Peter responded with phileo. And then what's so amazing is that Jesus came down to the level of Peter. And he says, I phileo you. Do you phileo me? And Simon Peter said, yes, I phileo me. And what's so great about that is that, you know, as sinners, we can never reach to where Jesus was. And I'm so thankful that, you know, Jesus came down to my level. You know, he set aside his divinity. He put on a robe of flesh. I'm so thankful. It reminds me of a song. It says, when Jesus reached down for me. And, you know, that's the only way I could ever have gotten saved uh, is by Jesus reaching down toward me. <clears throat> now we move on. And there's a word called uh, st Stragago. And, you know, what this love is, this love has its basis in one's own nature. Uh, storge is a natural affection or a natural obligation. It is a natural movement of the soul for the husband, wife, child. It's kind of like a family love or, or, or a dog. It is a quiet, abiding, abiding feeling within a man and woman that rests on something close to him or her and that he or she feels good about. Now, storge is compounded with philo, philos, and it's tra translated as kindly affection. No, but I, however, uh, when it has the prefix of A, it is translated as unloving. And an example of this, of this unloving is how, uh, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despiser of those that are good. And that is in 2 Timothy <coughs> chapter 3, verse 3. And then finally, we have eros, and this is this love is erotic love. It, eros is a love of passion and an overmastering that seizes and absorbs itself into the mind. It is a love that is an emotional involvement based on body chemistry. It is a love based on self satisfaction, and even though it is directed towards them, another, and it still involves self uh, self in mind. So, an example is this: I love you because. Uh, I love you because you make me happy. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is considered, eros can be considered as a conditional love. Eros is not used in the New Testament. Now before I further move on, uh, something about this chapter 13. Charity is mentioned nine times. And in this chapter, please forgive me. My voice has a ten tendency to get dry. The argument in this chapter about Paul is that love is an action and it's not an emotion. And I, before I get into this, uh, you know, what G, what this love is, it's an action. It has an attitude uh, about it. You know, it's not based on emotion. Sadly, today we base love on emotions. Uh Here's what Jesus said unto them. This is an example of what agape love can be. Is Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is likened unto this, likened unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws. And now here's another example that's uh, found in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. Galatians 5:22. Is, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. Uh, I like what this the, the author of this uh, statement is unknown. Love always seeks to help, never to hurt. <coughs> and that's agape, agape love. There's another reason that this was written. This was also written as a stern rebuke to the Corinthians and their abuse of using tongues. You know, and when I speak of tongues... I'm talking about speaking in another language and not the babbling that you know, the Pentecostal people like to use. Uh, what Paul is trying to say and what Paul is trying to show is just how important the gift of speaking in a tongue is. 
And uh, when we look at verses 1 through 3, I want to kind of break this up. The word tongue is, and the Greek word is glossia. And this is an uncertain affinity. The tongue by implications, a language especially one naturally acquire. And an example of this, you know, if you want to know what the Bible says about tongues, you know, the Bible is very good about interpreting it in itself. And one of the interpretations of what we can understand about tongues is in Acts chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. This is where Peter got up. You know, and he would speak to the multitude of people. And this is what it said. Now, when this was noised about, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these men which speak Galilean? And how, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So, you know, the tongue is speaking another language. I want to go back to there. Uh, it's an amazing thing that in the first three verses, you know, there is a threefold nothing. In verse 1, you know, uh, Paul speaks, even though he speaks with the tongue of men and the tongue, tongue of angel, and he says he have not charity. You know, Paul was able to speak in all tongues. Later in the in chapter 14, he talks about how he's able to speak in tongues more than everybody else. But, you know, what he's saying is, I've become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Uh, you know, he just spoke noise. So basically what uh, Paul was stating was that he says, I'm, I say nothing. That's the first fold, nothing. You know, Paul said he can have the, the gift of prophecy, even have the great faith, to have a great faith to move a mountain. But if this faith was not in charity, he says, I am nothing. So I say nothing. I am nothing. And finally, he says, even though if he was to give all that he had to the goods, if he, if he, even if he was to suffer persecution, if there is no love behind it, he profited nothing. So, you know, the threefold nothings would end up saying, verse 1 is, I say nothing. Uh, verse 2 is, I am nothing. And verse 3, I profited nothing. Now, in verse verses 4 through 7, Paul has shown us what love looks like. And how it acts. You know, love is not an emotion in these verses. Uh, it, what's so amazing is in these, and from four, verses 4 through 7, there are 15 verbs used to show us how love acts, the attitude that it has, and how love behaves. If you want to know what love looks like, I would ask that you read uh, Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Well, he starts off with charity suffers long in his kind. So what he's saying is that uh, suffering long or long suffering uh, is patience and does not have a one more chance attitude. You know, when somebody messes up towards us and gets us mad or they do something to harm us, uh, we have to send it to say, all right, just one more time, that's it. You know, charity says, you know what, I'm going to continue to love this person. I'm going to be patient with them. And even though they hurt me, I'm still going to love them. I like uh, one of the points that Dr. Jack Howes has. He says, I will be a friend to my friend. You know, this is an ultimate example of, of love. No matter what your friend does, you still love them. Now, after all, we're all humans and we're going to make mistakes. And there might be a time when we might hurt them. And then the word is kind. You know, and what this defined as is supposed to do well, uh, good to others to make them happy by granting them their requests, supplying their wants or assisting them in distress, having tenderness or goodness of nature, beloved and benignant. Uh, and that, Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, this is one of the things that we have to do is to forgive others for their sins against us. You know, if we don't forgive them, then... Uh, God cannot forgive us. No charity, even if not, uh, this means that love has no jealousy. Love is not jealous. Charity vaunted not itself and is not puffed up. To vaunt, to vaunt is to boast or to make a vain display of one's worth or attainments or decorations or to talk with a vain obstinance or to brag. So no love does not brag. It's not puffed up. It doesn't show pride of oneself. It doesn't say, hey, look at me. 
You know, what love will do is love will uplift a person. Uh, does not behave itself unseemly. unseemly. It does not act ugly towards others. You know, it seeketh not her own. Love looks after the well-being of others. It is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Love is not so easily angered. You know, and this is one thing as uh, <clears throat> as being in the flesh, you know, we have to deal with anger. And what love does is love tries to escape. It does not get provoked easily. It does not anger easily. Uh, and is always thinking of good. Love thinks for the good of people and not the evil and not the bad. Uh, it rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. And iniquity is injustice, unrighteous, and sin. Uh, love does not rejoice in doing sin. What love rejoices in is when truth and truth. It beareth all things. That means to support sin as to bear weight or burden. You know, bear uh, love would love allows me to bear the burden of another Christian or another brother and sister in Christ. I'll say to them, look, I'm here. I'll I'll bear with you. I'll pray with you. Love believeth all things. Love is believeth all things. It's not quick uh, to accept a false accusation or not a, a accusation against a Christian. What love does when it believeth all things, it's going to say, no, I don't believe that. You know, they're too good of a person. And what it does is when it when it, love believeth all things, it gives the benefit of the doubt. Uh, it hopeth all things. Uh, <clears throat> and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God to them who are to called according to the purpose. This is in Romans 8, 28. It looks for the good in everything, no matter what the trials and tribulation is, or if we're facing hard times or sad times. Uh, it looks for that, I guess what you say, that uh, that treasure at the end of the rainbow. Uh, it looks for the good. I mean, it says you know, somehow there's some good in all of this that's happened. That's what love does. It endureth all things, uh, to bear with patience, to bear without opposition or sinking under the pressure. You know, uh, Paul wrote to Second Timothy, and he said, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. We, uh, and then we'll go on to here. Uh, it says, on verse 8, forgive me, it says, Charity never faileth. Charity, love, will always endure. Uh, what can we know as opposed to prophecy? Uh, prophecy shall fall away, the tongue shall cease, and knowledge shall vanish away. Charity will never uh, fail. And then verses 9 through 10, it says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Uh, this is the gift that is spoken in verse 8. These were the signs of the spiritual, the, the parts, or what Paul was talking about was the spiritual spiritual gifts. And the thing about it is the word, that which is perfect, is the completion of the Bible. Since we have a the completion of the Bible, the Word of God itself, and uh, we have no need of signs. And here's the thing, all 66 books of the Bible is perfect, and there is no need of signs. You know, we're in the age of church, or the, what we call the age of grace. And this is what Jude one three said. It said, Beloved, when I gave all dims to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. <clears throat> There's no need to add to God's word because you no know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Saving faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. It is not these signs that can save a person. Uh, when Paul moves on, he goes on, he says, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So the three things we're going to notice is, the first is Paul saying, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. The signs are, or the gift are done away with because, once again, we have the completion of God's word. Uh, the signs were used in the infancy of the church as it was growing. Uh, I've there was a need for signs to show the proof of God. Uh, proof of God. Now that we have the completion of God's word, we don't need a sign. We find everything we need in God's word. There's salvation, sanctification, joy, and service. 
the signs of gifts were just temporal for the little children, the, the church in its young age. The permanent gifts are for the mature believer. And a good example of this can be found in Ephesians 4, 11, chapter 4, verse 11 through 15. And then you know, uh, it said, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I am known. And I like what Dr. John R. Rice says about this. He made a statement about this verse. He says, Now we see darkly, but one day the dark glasses of our humanity will fall away to leave a perfect vision of perfect knowledge. And that perfect knowledge and that perfect vision will be when we get to heaven. And then we close out with. And now abided faith, hope, charity. See three, but the greatest of these is charity. So the three three things that abide above all else is faith, hope, and charity. But charity is the greatest of all. And once again, I will refer to Dr. John R. Rice. He says, faith will become sight. That's a glorious thing. Uh, one day, we shall see Jesus face to faith. Our faith will become sight. Uh, I'm, I look forward, I truly look forward to when I see Jesus. Uh, you know, I always acknowledge Him as my Lord and Savior before men. And this is something that all Christians should do. But I look forward to the faith today that I can see Jesus face to face. And I can I can kneel at Him and I can look at to Him and say, look to Him face in, in His face. <clears throat> Please forgive me, my Lord, my God. Faith will become sight. Our hope will, will be fulfilled. And this is not a wishy kind of hope. This is a, a hope that has substance. You know. But love will be greater and more perfect than all. And the reason why love is so great is we will be in heaven because of the love that God had for us. For God so loved the world. And I just hope that you have enjoyed this little study. I hope it will be a blessing to you. I truly hope first and foremost that it glorified God. This is the total purpose of this ministry is that God will be glorified. Without this, I would not be doing it. But, you know, God be glorified. Uh, praise be to God for the great things He hath done. And secondly, I just truly hope that this was a help to you. Uh, I want to thank you once again for watching and taking this time for watching it. And let you know that I do love you. And I love you. Uh, thank you. God bless you. And goodbye. Come and die, the master call it. Come and